pleased uh, today to have with us uh, uh, Professor Jenny Benoit Pignon, who is uh, from the University of Bordeaux. Um, uh, Jenny has uh, a master's degree in computer science and engineering uh, uh, and a PhD in systems and control from uh, Moscow Technical University, uh, and had her uh, HDR degree from the University of Nantes. Uh, France, and uh, after postdoctoral work, uh, she at, at uh, uh, Nantes, she uh, uh, moved to uh, the University of Bordeaux in 2001 uh, as chair of video analysis and indexing research at the Labri uh, uh, Laboratory. Uh, research uh, interests are video and image analysis and indexing for video uh, retrieval and coding. Uh, she's the author, co-author of more than 100 journal articles. Uh, conference papers and chapters and books, uh, and has been um, uh, on the international scene many times, uh, um, and uh, we're very, very pleased to have her here. She was here yesterday, uh, um, and will provide uh, uh, some high-definition video for the Open Video Project, so this will be the first high-definition video that will be generally available for test purposes on the web, and so we'll have an ongoing kind of collaboration there, and uh, without further ado. Welcome. Thank you very much, Gary, for introducing me. So, uh, my lecture today is entitled Indexing of Compressed Video Content. And this is the result of research work done by my colleagues, Christian Kais, Aurélie Collard, Claire Bon, Jean Philippe de Manger, and myself at Labri in our research group uh, Video Analysis and Indexing in Image and Sound Department and uh, uh, all these people are working together with University of Bordeaux. So the summary of my talk is the following. First of all, we will discuss why we need to index compressed content. Then we will introduce uh, the rough indexing paradigm where we are working with. And we will go into details of the actual research on scalable indexing of compre compressed video streams such as H264 and JPEG 2000. And then we will briefly, very briefly, I have not much time, speak about rough indexing applied to the problem of video summaries construction. And this is our work in the frame of track with content. And then we will conclude this talk. So today, a common user is overloaded by visual information coming from various sources such as broadcasting, broadband communications, uh, stored TV programs in archives, professional video archives of cinema, not only TV, of digital cinema, and uh, he creates his own content and constitutes private collections of home videos. And all this video today with the modern acquisition devices is available in a compressed form, already compressed form. And the standards uh, today, which are uh, the most frequently used, are MPEG-2 for broadcast, but H264 already for broadcast, MPEG-4 ABC for low bitrate video, let's say uh, low resolution or standard resolution, and MJPEG 2000 for digital cinema and also for high quality archiving in preservation of <coughs> cultural heritage. So uh, you know very well that in various situations all this video content is completely raw. We don't have enough metadata or we have a very small amount of textual metadata which are not sufficient to browse and retrieve in an intelligent way. So this is our task to uh, index this content on pixel-based level. So uh, let me introduce the rough indexing paradigm, which is the concept we uh, first proposed uh, in 2001, and which means that we want to do a fast and approximate analysis of video content at a poor or intentionally degraded resolution. So we will uh, deal with uh, very noisy data, very low resolution data, and try to mine this data in order to extract meaningful things such as objects or camera motion or short boundaries. <coughs> so uh, 
our first shot boundary, uh, shot boundary detector and camera motion estimator based on MPEG-2 motion vectors, but applied to MPEG-1 motion vectors uh, available in thread video collection, was developed in 2001. And the rough data we used were the uh, motion vectors, the number of intracoded blocks in these streams, and also the DC coefficients in iframes, which means that we dealt with very low resolution images, eight times less than the original resolution. So here I will just show you our results in 2004 when we a little bit improved this detector. We are not uh, in the topest ranked people, but we are still have uh, uh, a very decent, let's say, result, knowing that uh, we use a very small amount of information and we do not decode the stream. So these results encouraged us to follow this direction, and uh, we uh, now apply this rough indexing in compressed domain in a wide range of standards. So uh, the objectives when working with compressed data are to reuse the low-level content descriptors computed for coding purposes in any literature <coughs> devoted to, to, to uh, MPEG video compression standards. You can read that motion vectors in the MPEG stream were optimized for coding purposes that they cannot be reused for analysis. And this is exactly what we are doing. We prove the contrary. So uh, this allows to perform indexing simultaneously with encoding, <coughs> uh, because you reuse the encoding parameters. And when you face the huge amount of data already encoded, then you can use these descriptors. And what is specifically interesting for us today, how to use them at different resolution levels, which are available in uh, modern standards, such as H264 or MJPEG 2000, I mentioned. And this reuse of uh, encoded data at various resolution layers is specifically interesting for HD because imagine that you have to decode video at full resolution, then you will have uh, for the mm, <coughs> format uh, 1080p approximately four megabyte per frame. It is tremendous amount of data. So we would not decode. We would reuse and we will reuse a different resolution. So uh, the context of our LTL research uh, is the following. We uh, have today uh, a very interesting project which is uh, supported by National Agency of Research, IR. Its uh, title is ECOS IHD, Joint Scalable Indexing and Encoding of Video Content. <coughs> and we work on this uh, uh, two modern standards I mentioned. So our tasks are global motion estimation in video, which corresponds to the camera motion, because the camera motion uh, uh, translates and somehow expresses uh, the idea of uh, the operator and of the film director. So it has its inherent semantics. Then object extraction, trajectory estimation of moving objects, relative distance estimation of moving objects, these parameters are necessary for queries by trajectory, such as for sport content, uh, for soccer games, uh, or other. But also, what is uh, a leading application in indexing of uh, multimedia information is the copy detection. Mm. And a lot of work has been already devoted to the uh, copy detection. Um, with local description of images, and what we try to do is uh, to do the compressed domain code detection. And finally, what is interesting for us is object-based video indexing and retrieval, which means that in a given row video stream compressed, we uh, want to perform a query by example, 
and uh, to retrieve objects, or we would like to perform query by clip, uh, video clip, and retrieve clips containing extracted objects. So let us go a little bit in technical details, and here I show you uh, the general block diagram of H264 uh, AVC encoding standards which properties are spatial, <coughs> temporal, and quality scalability, which means that the same video content can be encoded at a very low spatial resolution. So this is the base layer in spatial scalability. It can be encoded at a very low uh, visual quality. And uh, here we can see that we try to improve this quality and also depth encode supplementary enhancement layers. And it can also be encoded at a, um, a low temporal resolution and enhanced temporal resolution, which means frame rate. So uh, if we take this aspect, which is absolutely uh, uh, important for us, uh, such as motion coding in H264, then we can see, if you are familiar with MPEG-2 standard, that in H264 we also have images which are uh, named instantaneous decoder refresh, which are encoded independently of any other images in the stream. And in between, we have all these images uh, encoded by motion. And if you can see with these uh, arrows, that this encoding can be done at different temporal frame rates. So we can remove everything but uh, uh, keep only this image, and this will be the base layer in temporal resolution encoding. So now let us see what we are doing with this stream. First of all, we will extract motion vectors. And these motion vectors, as you have seen on the previous scheme, can be extracted at different temporal resolution. Then we will apply a global motion estimation uh, to this rough set of motion vectors. And we'll get here uh, good motion vectors, which are conform to the estimated model, and outliers, and these outliers will allow us to extract the mask of something which moves with a different motion compared to camera motion, and this something can be an object. And uh, using these masks, we can uh, finally filter this, uh, this masks along the time, extract objects, track objects, and visualize <coughs> the trajectories of object, uh, objects, estimate the distance of objects with regard to the camera, knowing that we have absolutely no information on the camera parameters because it is just raw monocular video, and use all this in color detection. So let us see what are the motion vectors we are able to extract from H264 compressed stream. You can see that basically, uh, we have two kinds, two classes of these motion vectors. Uh, one class corresponds to the homogeneous camera motion, and another class, let's say it is a uh, set of uh, very noisy and uh, uh, uncorrelated even motion vectors. But somehow they also express uh, the object motion. So uh, we cannot use this information as is. We have to filter it. And to do this, we suppose uh, that all uh, the blocks in the image plane which uh, correspond to the background of our scene uh, follow uh, a six-parameter model of camera. So this is a typical a fine uh, motion model in image plane. And our goal is to estimate these parameters. Okay. Uh, we denote the parameter vector by theta, and we apply the related uh, least square estimation 
in order to get uh, these parameters. Mm. Also, uh, the interest in this <coughs> in these squares, and we will see uh, later that it can be uh, just a very, very rich approach or very simple approach, is how to use this W, which is the uh, weighting matrix, because each weight uh, will somehow uh, uh, ponderate the contribution of a motion reactor, a national hour measure, into the whole uh, estimation process. And uh, in this work for HT 164, uh, this is uh, a very simple scheme. It means that uh, these weights are chosen as to be Gaussians. So let us see an example of how it works. <coughs> you can see uh, here panoramic camera motion and uh, uh, proper object motion, and also a sort of uh, zoom. Uh, and here you can see uh, the motion uh, parameters of a global camera model estimated. And you can see that the direction of panoramic motion, the red line, is uh, coherent only what we observe in scheme in the scene. And also uh, we have some variations of the zoom parameter because uh, the person will be filmed uh, with uh, small changes of the depth of the camera. You, you can uh, see it on the sequence. Uh, it is not so bad as a result. And also, uh, the effect of awakening of all measures will allow us, by a simple thresholding, to detect the blocks, the vectors, which have very low weights which are not relevant with regard to the model, and thus we can extract motion uh, masks in the whole field. And this is done in frame by frame process, and of course this extraction is very rough, so we have to filter uh, this extraction, and also we can estimate motion for that motion. And when we have done this, for a couple of uh, successive frames and uh, further and further in the video sequence, we can accumulate all the detection in what it is called motion history images. These motion history images were first introduced by Bratsky and Davis uh, uh, on the uh, uh, raw pixel video in uh, computer vision applications. And uh, here we just see an extension to the compressed domain. And when we have these motion history images, we can also uh, estimate motion for each mask uh, using the reference frame. And we also can filter this sort of stack when compensating motion of the image. So let us see uh, how it works for the detection. Mm, this is uh, about the uh, number of objects de detected in uh, <coughs> a sequence. And uh, you can see that uh, the detection rates are quite good. The recall is quite good in this method. Uh, and the precision sometimes uh, drops. And uh, that also uh, we have very good uh, uh, computational times because uh, we, we are here at the rates which are higher than video decoding rate. In video decoding rate, we have 25 frames per second, and here the processing rate is 26 frames per second, okay? So this was the frame-by-frame -frame extraction, but we also need to make a sort of temporal link between objects. We need to track and once extracted, it is not a very difficult task. The only problem is when you have only one object, as it was the case in the street with trees and bicycle. Let's see once more the sequence. Uh, the problem is not so difficult. But if you have several objects which will occlude each other, then we have to take a right decision which object is in front of the other. 
So uh, here uh, some possible uh, <coughs> approaches have been developed in the past. In my research, I devoted a lot of reflection, a lot of effort to resolve these problems for MPEG-4 encoding by, by the past. And here we are still in the rough indexing paradigm. We uh, would not like to go into very much detail and test uh, if the texture of one object corresponds to the texture of another object in the next frame and do all this fine processing. We just try to reason on the angle between the trajectories of the objects and also use mm, the object history images. And what is the object history images? The object history images uh, is constructed to allow stabilize the object reference point. If the shape of an object does not change a lot in the sequence, then we will have a, a, a very wide uh, object history image, which means that all the masks of objects extracted along the sequence are superimposed well one on another. But if the object changed its shape, then we can see a sort of flu on the border of these masks. And so mm, when we have a stronger uh, uh, deformation, which happens during the occlusion because a part of object is masked, uh, then uh, we will use these object history images to re-estimate the local motion and to separate objects. And for local option, uh, motion estimation, the process is basically the same. So you can see this, uh, the same sequence I will not show you. But uh, here we can see another sequence when we have global camera motion and also local motion of the object, which is very much noticeable. So, uh, what can be done for each mask, we will estimate with the remain these squares. And here you can see the motion parameters of the person and the typically uh, translational components, which is very strong from left to right. It is depicted by the right curve. And now you can see a, a, a very uh, nice, very <laughs> um, tricky representation of the video proposed by our PhD student, uh, which is uh, um, the sort of 3D uh, representation when he will uh, depict uh, the center of mass of the object along the time and this will give us the trajectory of object and uh, from uh, uh, the reddish to bluish it is the time axis here. So uh, using these curves as descriptors we can apply, for instance, uh, polygonal approximation uh, or uh, second order approximation as in MPEG-7 trajectory descriptors and make carry on based on this. And uh, also, I will show you some a little bit more complex sequence coming from uh, cinema content. And you can see uh, the trajectories along the time. And here is the beginning. And placement of the object. Another small uh, sequence is called monitor and uh, you can see that uh, the system detected well two objects and their trajectories are depicted here. So uh, when the trajectory is known, the motion parameters is known, uh, a distance uh, can be estimated between the object and camera view and uh, it is based on the evolution of uh, uh, geometric parameters of the object detected along the time, such as uh, the <coughs> surface of the mask, the aid and the width of the object. Of course, we cannot say that is it uh, the camera which is doing zoom or it's the object which is uh, uh, moving along the uh, <coughs> visual axis, but uh, still we can uh, estimate this approximate distance and here is the present representation of uh, uh, this uh, distance uh, in a sort of 3D space. And um, now we have plenty of data. We have camera motion, we have objects, we have objects trajectory, and so on and so forth. 
And what about query? And what, how we will use the query? Here you can see how we use the motion parameters of the camera to detect copies of videos. And this is typi typically the same problem as find me the clip which is similar to my clip. Uh, so first of all, <coughs> the motion parameters are reformulated. We will uh, compose what we call a translation component, which is the sum of pan and teeth, so horizontal and vertical motion translation. And also what we call the deformation parameters, uh, which is basically rotation and zoom. And the order of these components is completely different because uh, here in France we are at the pixel distance, pixel level, and uh, for these parameters they are very, very small in our completely fine model. So uh, we have to uh, compare them separately. And to compare them, we just take these curves along the time and compute the correlation, normalized correlation of the curves. And uh, um, yeah, the evolution of motion parameter <coughs> is seen as a 1D signal along the time. And for given clip and uh, uh, clear clip and for clips in the database, we will correlate these curves. And so uh, the maximum of the correlation uh, will uh, not only gives uh, give us uh, <coughs> the answer if it is a copy, but also uh, allows to position the clip in a more long video call. So it is an interesting application. And uh, here you can see uh, uh, a part of uh, uh, the corpus uh, we developed and uh, <coughs> using uh, here in this case uh, uh, professional co uh, corpus. And uh, uh, we transformed our video clips in order to test the robustness of the system with regard to various transformations, uh, such as uh, affine transformations but also something which is very, very much popular now, go to YouTube and you, you will find uh, different versions of the same format. You will find very low resolution, you will find even almost HD content, something which was filmed in the cinema theater, something which was picked up from a DVD, uh, so different resolutions, and this is why uh, uh, such transformation as a recycled <coughs> drop. Okay, so the idea is to detect if this is the copy of our video, well, even if it was transformed very strongly, such as crop. Okay, <coughs> so now I will speak about GPF 2000 or MGPF 2000. Uh, as uh, you know, that uh, <coughs> digital cinema is encoded, uh, content is encoded in MGPF 2000 and uh, that uh, digital archiving trend now is always to encode in the uh, uh, highest quality standard and the highest quality standard is MGPF 2000 and for instance uh, Build and Gelland uh, which is Film Museum, Film Archive in Netherlands is now migrating all its content in digital into JPEG 2000. And a lot of archives are doing the same in Europe. So uh, when compressed content is available in this standard, we also need to index. And uh, here, uh, what I will show you is basically <coughs> the same as we have seen in H264. But the inherent property of JPEG 2000 standard is uh, that it allows to extract objects at different resolution levels because the mathematical orthogonal transform used to encode is a wavelet pyramid. And so uh, now we will see how we do for this. <coughs> First of all, let's speak about object extraction. The general philosophy is uh, first to segment at the lowest resolution and then to refine segmentation results. Oops. 
to refine segmentation results when propagating to the higher resolution values. And at the end, if we want to get our object at full resolution, which means uh, 1080p, we don't do much effort at the full resolution. Everything is already has been already propagated. So, uh, what is the information in this case we deal with? Uh, it is the discrete wavelet transform, which is supposed to be applied to the whole image. Uh, I have to say that JPEG 2000 standard was designed to allow encoding with the areas of interest, of a region of interest. <clears throat> it means that if someone segmented an image into the areas where he wants the quality to be higher, then the standard allows to encode very much precisely with a good quantization step these areas and compress the rest of the image more rapidly. This is foreseen in the standard. But what actually happens that Practically never you can see such streams because of the segmentation problem. It is a very tedious task uh, from general point of view. It is still an open problem. The humanity is uh, fighting with since uh, uh, 25, uh, 30 years and it has not been solved yet. So, the only way is to ask some PhD students or another curators to manually extract objects and then submit this mask to GPF 2000 standard for encoding. But it is possible for one image. It is not possible for 25 or 30 images per second. So what we have is uh, the raw GPF. And uh, uh, we suppose that uh, the compression is uh, lossy. It means that uh, wavelet coefficients were quantized. So uh, this is a little bit about how it is built. So you can see uh, here that uh, in JPEG 2000 standards, uh, the 9 uh, to 7 Dobichy's wavelets are used. And uh, what happens? that basically there is a cascade processing scheme in which mm, we always will obtain a low uh, level, uh, low um, frequency subbound and high frequency subbound H. Then um, uh, this cascade is uh, applied to lines and to columns and uh, <coughs> for each uh, uh, line or column set we will obtain this low frequency and high frequency. And uh, what happens finally, we can reiterate it. And uh, uh, as the uh, whole chain uh, comprises the uh, subsampling uh, by the factor of two, then finally we will have a wavelet pyramid with uh, uh, the resolution level uh, which uh, are decreased by a factor of two at each time. And uh, this is done independently for each component, Y and U and V, color each. Uh, so we will have at each level four suburbs. The first one is uh, the um, low frequency suburb. And here in the image, you can see that it contains uh, the most important information, it contains a sort of a very much filtered and subsampled version of the original frame. And the three subbands here will express the directionality of contrasts in the image. So this is basically the textural information. And both the structural color and textual information is interesting to extract objects to make our segmentation. 
So here is the whole scheme. It is a little bit complex, but what we have to say with regard to JPEG 2000 compared to age 264. We are not so lucky in JPEG 2000. We don't have more predictors. And one extra object we need, first of all, to find the outliers with the metal. Thus, we have to develop a motion estimator. You can say, okay, motion estimation is not a problem anymore. There is a lot of methods which have been developed in standards, block matching, and theoretical block matching, Koga method, and so on. The problem is that we do not want decode image. Hence, we have to work on the wavelet pyramid. And the motion estimation on the wavelet pyramid is a problem because the wavelet decomposition is not invariant with regard to such a simple <coughs> fine transformation as a pure translation. So we have to do something which can be sufficiently intelligent to get the kind of motion. So uh, I'm with my PhD student. We developed a, a block-based uh, wavelet estimator, which will start at the uh, lowest resolution level on the uh, top of the pyramid and estimate on a block-based basis, as it is the case for other standards. These motion vectors are noisy. So what we will do, we will try to extract global model from them. Because still, even if they are noisy, if uh, they are suffering from aliasing in these wavelet images, they still translate the general model. And our experiences show that this is true. So we will apply global motion estimation. And hence, we will regularize motion field. And this regular motion field will be projected onto the uh, higher resolution level, and the process will be repeated. Projection, refinement by local block-based estimation, and so on and so forth, up to the first level of the pyramid. Of course, <coughs> it is also logical to suppose six parameter of fine motion model in uh, image plane, it is exactly as in the previous case, mm -hmm. but uh, the difference is that we will not use a simple uh, weighting scheme, but we will use a robust estimator, which was proposed by Turkey and which we extensively studied in our previous work. And in this case, the weighting scheme is a little bit uh, more complex. Okay, here you can see the examples of extraction of motion masks from a sequence. And here you can see the results of uh, motion estimation uh, in wavelet pyramids and the regularization and extraction of uh, motion masks. Uh, here it is uh, uh, in inverse version. In white, you have global camera motion, and in black, oops, you have the motion mask. And hence we have our global motion index in the same way in JPEG 2000 as we had it in H264. We can do queries on, on this. But now let us see uh, what about objects, because this is our goal. We are more interested in objects than in the rest. So what we propose is to combine these two informations uh, compared to the previous work where we used only motion information, here we all also <coughs> use the color information. It is easily available, it is available in the pyramid, okay? So we will do the same, we will start from the top of the pyramid, and we will use uh, the methodology uh, we developed in our previous work, which means that we apply morphological segmentation approach, to independently segment uh, the image, compressed image, in the wavelet domain, and we apply it to the uh, low frequency sample. 
and you can see here some steps of this uh, segmentation. So you can see the pre-filtering of image, gradient computation, then marker definition, and finally the result of segmentation. And then we can uh, superimpose it onto our motion mask and try to propagate and refine it in the welded pyramid. So here, I will probably not go into uh, very much details of this refinement. The main idea here is that we use the welded principle of locations. <coughs> it means that if we take a coefficient in a given subband at a given resolution level, we know exactly what are the coefficients it was uh, computed from at the lower resolution level. So for instance, for this uh, square, we can see that these coefficients are known. And um, in this way, the projection is very simple. We do not need to, to look for where is this pixel can be matched. We know where. And when we know where, we also know how. So that is, there is some uh, bias from left to right in this projection. And this is why when we will do morphological processing uh, around the borders of the object, then we will use specific structuring elements. So here you can see the projected version. You can see the blocking artifacts on the border. We define the uncertainty area, and we will work with this. And now, if you look at this object, you can see that it is much prettier huh? because it has a very smooth border due to our morphological process. And in this morphological process, we also brought something interesting, which means that uh, when uh, <coughs> doing a rigid drawing algorithms, we can here to morphological processing. We introduced a specific term, THF, which means that we try to incorporate the high frequency content that uh, we will uh, somehow block the propagation of morph morphological region growing if in high frequencies we have strong values of coefficients we will walk uh, the propagation <coughs> through the corners. But morphological refinement is not always so performant. You can see that if we lose an object, we cannot recover it uh, at the lower level. And in the previous image, you have seen that we lost the head of this uh, boy, uh, for instance. So uh, another alternative is to use uh, classical Markov rand, uh, random field models in order to uh, refine uh, the results of our projection. And here once more, we used the inherent properties of web pyramid when formulating the uh, potential functions for the regularity of the segmentation. So in classical uh, Markov random field modeling based approaches, you have to minimize two terms of energy. The first one is relevant to the data, and the second one is the relevant to the regularity of uh, distribution of the labels in the uh, segmentation map. And we also introduced high frequency coefficients into it. Now you can see a small example of a sequence, which is our corpus sequence, and you can see uh, some excerpts of this segmentation, okay? And now, when we have extracted object, what about queries? How will we compare one object, for example, with the object extracted from the database? Of course, an exact matching is absolutely impossible because it is video. Objects are moving, they are deformable and so on. So, what about some global index to compare. And we thought that finally the histogram of wave coefficients can be a good index to compare objects 
without the complaint in different resolutions. Of course, we have to have sufficiently large objects for this index to be uh, statistically represented. <clears throat> and thus, we consider two uh, wavelet histograms. <coughs> the first one, we call it uh, HF, takes into account the coefficients in high frequency suburbs. This histogram will uh, express the textural homogeneity or non-homogeneity of an object. The second one is a classical uh, low frequency histogram, which means that we recover just the color components from uh, low frequency suburbs. And we will have uh, object-based index as a, a, a pair of low frequency and high frequency histograms. And uh, now let us make a query by example. We have to compare objects. So first of all, when working with histograms, there is a normalization process. Because if the uh, lightning conditions are not the same, then we have to normalize and second problem <coughs> is uh, what is the similarity matrix to apply. So in our work, we used both uh, Swine and Ballard matrix, uh, histogram interception, and Batakari coefficient. And uh, experimentally, of course experimentally, we found that Batakari coefficient is uh, most, um, is better so here you can see an example of query by example when an object is segmented well, when it is a red frame, and when the segmentation process uh, lost the object. Why it is a, 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 such a small part of object is detected? Because the relative motion of this uh, person with regard to the background was not sufficient. So the outliers were detected in this place and then we have only the head. So um, here you can see <coughs> the robustness of the approach with regard to uh, affine transformations. And uh, in order to interpret these curves, uh, I explained the query. So we extract an object from one image and then we will compare it to the object extracted from the same clip, and this is the red curve, but object moves, so it changes. And with the clips, which undergone, which has, uh, have, sorry, undergone, the affine transformations. And the worst case is this uh, blue squares, because in these frames, the object was not detected at all. It did not move, so we did not detect it. And the best case, is in here when uh, the metric uh, is one, when uh, the object uh, was perfectly matched with the query object from the <coughs> Okay. So this is the introduction <coughs> of histograms, and this is but the career coefficient for a good image. And you can see that in this case of but the career coefficient, uh, the curve is uh, higher, thus it is better. And for the uh, uh, bad segmented frame, we observe uh, the same behavior of intersection matrix and Batakari coefficient. And finally, you can see here the receiver operating curve for the query by clip. What does it mean, query by clip? Up to now, we just took an uh, object example and look for objects. Now we will take a clip a video clip, extract objects, and try to match all extracted objects in this clip with all extracted objects in other clips. So as it is a histogram intersection of the Gary coefficient, it is uh, sufficiently fast. It's not real time, but sufficiently fast. And we will say that uh, the clip in a database matches the query clip if uh, the best match is higher than the certain simple rule. And here you can see the receiver operating curves. And once more, uh, 
this course uh, shows us that it is important to take into account both histograms, low uh, frequency and high frequency. And in the, the remaining time frame, very short, I will give some insights on how we use this rough indexing paradigm in the case of visual summaries uh, uh, production for video content. So our research group uh, has been participating in two track video BBC Russia's task uh, since uh, the second year, it means uh, 2007. And uh, our approach is somehow a semantically based approach, <coughs> which means that um, for us um, the uh, fundamental unit in a video is a video shot that uh, we need to extract it. Then in video shots uh, we need to extract uh, content which we have to filter such as junk frames but also the content we need to take into account and for us the summary it is a, a sequence of excerpts which contain meaningful events and objects uh, and for instance how to translate this uh, meaning uh, mining of uh, events or objects if we don't know what is in the content so we started with uh, some, let's say, general considerations, taking into account that BBC Russia's uh, was the result of shooting of soap operas. So if we have some faces, then it should be something interesting. If the object uh, moves very quickly or there is a, a huge motion activity in the frame, this is something to keep in the summary. And also the same is true for some activity. So we extract features, we merge these uh, uh, features along the time. And we will not, of course, uh, keep all the frames in video where these features have been detected because we have the redundancy in BBC rushes. Uh, you have several takes of the same scene. Thus, uh, first of all, uh, in parallel, we perform short clustering and retain only one short per cluster, only one representative per cluster, and then intersection and adjustment of these uh, uh, time curves, such as the presence of uh, interesting events and objects, and the uh, borders of clusters along the time, will give us a summary. And here is one of the examples of all processing uh, facilities we had to develop is the junk frame removal. So uh, junk frames are mirrors or uh, club walls and so on. And in Labri, we have specifically developed <coughs> the uh, uh, junk frame mirror detector. And here we all also uh, try to use the compressed stream um, it means that from MPEG-1, because BBC rushes are MPEG-1 compressed, we decode only iframes. And we even worked at uh, the DC resolution, but a DC resolution for histogram computation, you don't have sufficient uh, data. So, uh, we uh, now using iframes decoded, and in mirrors, the histograms, have a specific, uh, in RGB channels, have a specific form. They have uh, a small amount of modes compared to a natural scene. So this is uh, somehow requantization of the histograms. Number, we compute the number of modes, and it is also a threshold uh, uh, decision scheme. So another insight is about phase detection. I said that a face is an important object, semantically important object. So today there is a lot of research groups which have uh, addressed in their practice at least once the problem of face detection. You even have the OpenCV software uh, uh, freely available if you want to 
detect uh, traces. Okay? But the problem is that uh, all these detectors uh, work in uh, the paradigm of supervised learning. And of course, it is important uh, on which databases these detectors were trained. And uh, <coughs> the only Jones detector, which is in OpenCV, is very much performed. But when applied to a video with natural deformations, shading, changes of poles, and so on, uh, which are very noisy, it is difficult to get good results. For our experience, we had uh, the results of recalling precision lower than 58% for each. And this is due to the complexity of video content. Hence, uh, uh, with my former PhD students, once we wanted to detect the dialect scenes in the video. And uh, we said that uh, our problem will be to address, let's say, artistic content. And uh, when a director uh, asks the <coughs> a cameraman to produce this content, he has his own ideas about the color. And uh, when you watch films, you can see uh, the change of manner in the color production, let's say, of the film. So if we train the face detector on skin color, which was a trend in various research works, in a huge database, which has nothing to do with our field, then the results are not so good. So our idea was, <laughs> let's try to combine two detectors. The first one will be based on a geometrical contrast feature, which is an open CD detector. And then when he supplied us something, we will suppose that this something is a set of faces, and we will train the skin color on this. And hence, uh, relooping and reiterating this loop, we will remove those uh, <coughs> samples which do not follow our statistical model of color, and hence we will increase the precision in this detection. But we also will detect color patches of skin color in images, and probably there will be faces. But to take a decision, we need to know that if a face was detected in the top left position in the previous frame, it cannot be detected on the down right position in the current frame. So we use a geometrical filter and median filter on the coordinates of uh, the detected windows. And here you can see an example. So in this example, the open CD detector uh, cannot handle the situation of strong pause variation and also shadowing. And when <coughs> making these two detectors, open CD and skin color detector copyright, we get better results. OK, so uh, here are the results of our participation of a RIF ALU consortium uh, in track video BBC Russia's summary task, which we coordinated in Labri. We are not uh, in the topest uh, ranked um, participants, but still uh, we have uh, decent results, and uh, we will improve them in, in the future. So I thank you very much for your